Yeah, now we stop recording. <laughs> so our, for our second session this morning, after the first one with the minister, uh, we will have two speakers. Uh, the first one is Elad Kaplan, director of the Minamadin Center for Jewish and Democratic Law at bar University, a platform committed to developing legal and, and academic infrastructure mm -hmm. to facilitate synergy between the components of Israeli identity and impact the public discourse. He has filed several class action lawsuits in the Supreme Court that have led to systemic changes on the issue of conversion. Drafted the 2013 conversion bill, founded with various partners and designed the legal infrastructure for the Giyuk Alakha conversion network, provided individual assistance to hundreds of converts through the e -team Assistance Center, and provides legal counseling to the Ministry of Religious Services on issues of Judaism, religious services, and conversion. Today, you are going to share your experience with us, and we thank you very warmly for that. Mm -hmm. the floor so, is yours. Thank you for the invitation to be here. I'll just add that I also uh, um, have dealt with cases on proof of Judaism, including using technological means such as DNA testing, which Mathan uh, discussed. So I'm happy to discuss that issue as well. I'm currently writing my doctorate on the issue of the Rabbinus quest to prove Jewish status using technological means such as documents, databases, and DNA testing is a very complex issue, which is related to conversion, but mostly what I'll speak about is focused on conversion, but then we can discuss the wider issues of who is a Jew. Um, so <laughs> I'll, um, I'll, start, I'll start with a story. Um, Michael, I met a few years ago, uh, was born in the former Soviet Union. He grew up there. He, um, his mom was not Jewish. His dad was Jewish. But in his uh, community, in his school, he was related to as the Jew. Everybody saw him as a Jew. He related to himself as a Jew. He married Svetlana, who also had a Jewish father, but not a Jewish mother. And together they made Aliyah to Israel, which was their dream and their family's uh, dream. And, um, and they came in the early 90s, as soon as the Iron Curtain fell, um, had two kids here in Israel. And he didn't think of going through the conversion process. But then Michael's father died. And his last wish was that for one of his children to say Kaddish on his grave. And Michael wasn't Jewish. He couldn't say Kaddish. He started studying uh, for conversion. He went through a process of a year and a half studied everything there is. No, his whole family joined in, Svetlana, the kids also participated as they were small, but as uh, the best they could. Um, and, uh, and eventually he got to the Bet Din and the Bet Din wouldn't allow Michael to convert. What was the problem with Michael? I mean, he really studied everything. They kept Shabbat and, and Kashrut. One of Michael's two kids had um, special needs and he went to a special needs school, which was not a religious school. And the Bed Din said that if Michael doesn't take his kid out of the special needs school and move him to a religious school, then Michael's family won't be able to complete the conversion process. And Michael said, you know, I, as much as I want to convert to Judaism and say, Kaddish on my father's grave, these are the needs of my kids. And there was no special needs religious school uh, in the city in which he lived. And he had to, he had to start the process. And he turned to me, and I'll, I'll get back to Michael uh, in a bit. But this is one story out of thousands of stories. We're talking about, I'm, I'm sure you know the numbers, there are 450,000 people who made Aliyah according to the law of return. Many of them have a strong Jewish uh, identity. They see themselves as belonging to the wider Jewish community, but they're not Jewish according to Allah. And many of them are turning to the conversion courts to convert. Like Matan Khan said, it's not most of them, but it's still quite significant numbers. But only one out of every four people who turns to the conversion courts succeeds to complete the process, as according to official government data. So this is part of the bigger picture of the state of Israel. And what I want to do is address two fundamental problems, challenges that... Um, sit at the base of most issues of state and religion in Israel. Then I want to uh, discuss two different questions which shape both the public and political discourse of conversion in Israel, and how these two questions relate to two different narratives for the state of Israel. Okay, so um, 
Okay, so conversion is a personal, it's a communal, it's a legal and national issue. Everything is combined together. It creates many different complexities, both political, legal, and social. And one of the challenges is that Israel does not have a conversion bill. And this is not only the issue on conversion, Israel's marriage bill also dates back to the time of the Ottoman Empire. It's the same with the conversion bill. I mean, we don't have a conversion bill. We have a bill, which means that someone can change their religion from one religion to another. And a lot of Israel's legal infrastructure on issues of state and religion was not created by the state of Israel, but dates back to the British mandate and even to the Ottoman Empire. And the Turks weren't as interested in uh, Jewish unity or in gathering of exiles. Uh, what they were inter interested in was two things. They were inter interested in control and in order. And control and order still sit at the foundations of the DNA of the religious establishment's activity in Israel. So when we come to think about many of these issues of state and religion, we're actually addressing the way that these systems were founded by people who didn't really care about the Jewish people as a whole. The second challenge we have on many issues of state and religion is that we're dealing with two different uh, normative uh, um, uh, like backgrounds. Uh, there's, the, there's the legal infrastructure, civil legal infrastructure, and then there's the halakhic infrastructure. And where does halakha end and civil law begin is not always clear. Where the civil law end and, and halakhic law begin is, is, uh, sits at the base of many of the cases that we deal in, in state and religion as a whole, and specifically on the issue of conversion. We can see that we, when we track back the Supreme Court cases on conversion, many of them were not filed against the chief rabbinate of Israel. They were filed against the Ministry of Interior which is a civil body, which isn't supposed to operate according to the rabbinate's halakhic rulings. And yet many of the problems and challenges are caused there because of the implications of conversion, which means that people can register as Jews or make aliyah to Israel according to the law of return. So this mixture between law and uh, Jewish law, halakhic law and, and civil law is, is, is very challenging. Um, the result of this is that the religious establishment in Israel has become more and more closed and stringent, and it's created a go growing gap between the institutions which are responsible for the Jewish identity of the state of Israel and most of the Israeli public. And we can see according to surveys uh, done that the rabbinate is one of the, the um, public institutions which the general public trusts the least. A uh, survey done by the Israel Democracy Institute showed that about 20% of the Israeli public trusts the Rabbanut. So that's, I mean, even if we took people who are orthodox, religious, observant in Israel, then, then you know, that's, that's more than 20%. And this affects the conversion system as well. There's a lot of suspicion and uh, doubt when people turn to the conversion system. And this has grown more and more difficult and, and worse uh, during the years. I think in order to understand conversion in Israel, we have to address two different questions. The first question is, and this is the classic question discussed in the public sphere and in the halakhic sphere, is should conversion be more lenient or should it be more stringent? I think this is, I, I only got to the end of what Matan was discussing, but I think this was the main point. You know, maybe we should have more lenient conversions. Um, so it's the halachic discourse, so it's the public discourse. And the question is, Israel is an ingathering of exiles. It's a Jewish state. And do we have responsibility for those who were disenfranchised from their Jewish identity behind the Iron Curtain? They were in the former Soviet Union, people like Michael and Svetlana, who have a strong Jewish identity, but they're not halachically Jewish. And because of the situation in the countries they were living, when they return to the state of Israel, we should provide them an option to convert which, uh, convert, which is more open than what maybe existed in countries abroad where they were worried about people coming into the Jewish community. Um, and with a more open and attentive system, possibly people like Michael and many more people who have made Aliyah to Israel could find a solution within the state conversion system. But there's another question which is no less fundamental uh, to the issue of conversion in Israel. And the second question is the question which is the most central question to the legal 
and political discourse. And to give background to the second question, I'll, I'll start with another story. So Erika was born in Peru. Uh, she became interested in Judaism. She studied online. She decided to convert to Judaism, but there is no Orthodox conversion court in Peru. She went to go to an Orthodox conversion. She traveled to Dallas in the state. She was there for a few months, studied Judaism. Uh, her visa ended. She had to go back to Peru. And um, she continued being interesting, interested in, uh, in Judaism until a year later, she met Iran, who was an uh, Israeli after the army, um, you know, doing a, a trip around uh, South America. And he met Erika and she was already interested in Judaism. They sat, they studied together for a few days. Iran went back to Israel. He said, Erika, if you went, you know, come and visit me in Israel, that would be nice. <laughs> um, half a year later, Erika came to visit Iran and Israel. They studied some more together and they fell in love. And they were one of the most lovely couples uh, I've met. They wanted to go through the conversion process uh, here in Israel. And, um, and so, so Erika applied for a state conversion. And after uh, many delays, her application is approved to start the conversion process. If you're a non-Israeli, you have to apply both to start the process and then to apply for the Beddin and then to complete the process. So she studied for a year and a half and she was a really good student. I mean, if you can rank conversion students, she was the, the top of her class. And, um, but she faced many bureaucratic difficulties. She received negative treatment. There were prolonged delays. They, they lost her file twice in the, <laughs> in the conversion system. And at one point, Iran turns to the senior clerk in the rabbinate and he tells him about his family. Iran came from a Moroccan family and he, he says to the rabbinate clerk, my family were rabbis and they are meme in Morocco. It is really important for me to have a Jewish wedding. And they were both halakhically observant. So it's also difficult having a long-term relationship without Erika completing the conversion. And the rabbinate clerk turns to Iran and he says, well, if you come from such a from religious family, then why are you marrying a convert? Mm -hmm. So I don't think this represents all people within the rabbinate. This, this guy, this, I have several stories about him, <laughs> but he's a, he's a very okay. senior figure without, um, not, not while it's, uh, <laughs> but uh, he's a very senior figure within, within the, the system. I think that tells us something about the system. But Erika decides after this conversation, she decides to give up on the state conversion system. But because she's very knowledgeable in, in Judaism and she wants to go to an Orthodox conversion, she turns to one of the uh, most well-known Orthodox conversions in the world, Rabbi Nisim Karelit's conversion court in Bnei Brak. Now, um, this is an ultra-Orthodox conversion court. There's hundreds of people who turn to different issues to this, uh, this court. They deal not only with conversions, um, at the time, there's six rabbis who in the paper, Yated Neiman, it's the ultra-Orthodox paper, which um, the Lita'i ultra-Orthodox paper, who are called Maran. That's the most senior title an uh, ultra-Orthodox rabbi can receive. And Nisim Karelit is one of these rabbis. So this is by no means a lenient, liberal, or even non-Orthodox conversion. And Erika completes the conversion with Rabbi Nisim Karelit um, easily. They're very impressed with her knowledge. Every is, I mean, Shanchi didn't complete the process sooner in the state conversion courts. And Erika and Iran get married. It's a private wedding outside the Rabbanut because the Rabbanut won't recognize their conversion. And they have a baby boy. And the Ministry of Interior won't register Erika as Jewish and won't recognize their baby boy as Jewish. Now, Rabbi Nisim's, Nisim Karelitz's conversions are recognized by all of the Jewish world, from the most liberal to the most orthodox, except for some clerks in the Ministry of Interior <laughs> and in the Rabbanut. And I represent Erika and Iran as part of the Rigachova case, with several other cases which are fighting for their conversions to be recognized, private conversion courts, for the purpose of uh, the law of return, so they can complete the process uh, uh, sooner. Um, so the second question isn't just a question about more lineal conversions, but should we have a centralized system? And the question is, should we have a centralized or decentralized system since in most of the political and legal discourse? And if we look at the bills which have been filed on the issue of conversion throughout the years, the main question is, it's very difficult to write in a in a, in a bill, we want conversions to be more lenient. But we can't play if they're centralized or decentralized. There's always a question, can a uh, centralized system be 
a linear system. But it is possible to believe we should have linear conversions and centralized conversions. I think part of the challenge Matan Khan is facing that he wants to keep some elements of a centralized system, but he wants the conversions to be more lenient. And is that possible? If we go to Mosheni Sims bill from 2019, it was filed for the first time, then he went straight for the most centralized system possible, but he did everything in his power to make it more lenient. So these questions aren't necessarily the same question. They're very different, different questions. In 2013, I drafted a bill to decentralize the system. This was decentralizing it within the current sphere of um, local rabbis in Israel, but aiming to uh, uh, keep a uh, centralized administrative authority so the government can provide services to the conversions, but give complete religious autonomy to local rabbis. Just comparing it to Matan Khan's bill, he wants to create some level of halachic centralized authority as well. So we're aiming to give complete halachic autonomy, but keep some responsibility so that we don't have different conversion. Uh, you know, we would say it's the, it received the same you know, logo at the top of the state of Israel, but each local rabbi would be able to create his own conversion courts. And at the time, in 2000, the beginning of 2014, as part of a political deal, the bill was exchanged for a government resolution. So the challenge with the government resolution is it's easier to pass, but it's also easier to cancel. And this was part of the legal difficulties at the time. There were some elements within the, the Baita UD who didn't want the bill to pass. So we agreed to this, uh, to this trade-off. And the government resolution left us without a conversion bill, but it still was supposed to provide a potential solution for thousands of converts. And once the government resolution passed in the following weeks, I received dozens of phone calls of people calling me. And I was the director of E-Team at the time to calling E-Team's hotline and saying, when will the new system be in place? And when can we go through this new uh, conversion system? And at the time we said, you know, it'll take a few months, implementing government resolutions doesn't happen in a day or two, but you know, let's keep your phone number and it will happen soon. But it never happened. Uh, the government uh, fell apart, as happens in Israel many times, governments collapse over issues of state and religion, and this is one of the episodes in that government collapsing. A new government was founded in 2015, and one of the first decisions the new government made was to cancel the government resolution on conversions. One of the most serious offenses in the Torah is the prohibition of deceiving the converts. And I think that the government's decision to cancel the, the conversion resolution was probably the greatest deception of converts in the entire Jewish history. And there were thousands of people waiting and calling and waiting for the opportunity. And eventually we had to turn them down. Not wanting to leave them with no answer at all, we decided to work with dozens of rabbis to found the Gyul Kalacha Conversion Network which is a, there were private conversions, orthodox conversions before, but this was a network uh, with dozens of rabbis, Rashi Shivot, the heads of uh, religious institutions, uh, community rabbis, city rabbis. Most of them never thought of challenging the rabbinate. I mean, they even found that to be something that you know, wouldn't, wouldn't be possible for them, uh, for their belief. But they decided that as much as they didn't want to challenge the chief rabbinate, you can't leave thousands of people with no solution at all, or almost no solution. And Gil Kalaha was founded. Since then, it's turned, I think, into the largest private non-government conversion court in the world with over 1,500 conversions. Still not enough on the grand scale, but it's catching up with, uh, with what needs to be done. Michael and Svetlana, who I discussed at the beginning, had a very emotional uh, conversion, Jewish wedding uh, with their kids under the chuppah in Gyur Kalacha. Um, and, and today they're halachically uh, Jewish. Uh, and there's over 50 rabbis in Gyur Kalacha today who are active in the conversion courts. There's double that number of rabbis who support that, that activity. And these rabbis also represent Jewish communities around the Israel with thousands of members. So it's a growing movement of people who strongly believe in Jewish halakha, but do not find a solution within the existing systems of the rabbinate. And Itim's legal department prevailed in court 
meaning that Yul Kalacha will allow converts to be registered as Jewish in the Ministry of Interior. Um, all this relates to two narratives for the state of Israel. What does the state of Israel mean as a Jewish state? One narrative, uh, which I think you, you touched on before, believes that a Jewish state means having a unified system. You have one nation, one rabbinut, one conversion system, with one gateway to Judaism, which everybody has to go through. And the state of Israel should work as a, as a melting pot, especially for those coming from the former Soviet Union who were not halakhically Jewish. I think that this narrative has failed to unite the Jewish people. But there's another narrative for a Jewish state. And the second narrative believes that a Jewish state means that all Jewish communities should be welcome and have a place within the state of Israel. Um, that, um, that Israel should bless the diversity within Judaism and that that diversity can thrive and be cherished within the Jewish state. And I think that these two narratives lead to very different understandings of the way conversion should work in Israel. Uh, even between those believe, that believe that we should find solutions for converts. Um, and I think that if we look at what's happened over the past year in the Ministry of Religious Services, then this, uh, this stands at the, the, the base of it. Should we have a centralized system? Should we decentralize the system? How much we can go in decentralizing the system when really some people within the Ministry of Religious <laughs> Services would like it to be centralized? Personally, I didn't pray for uh, 2,000 years. I don't believe we, we prayed for 2,000 years for a Jewish state to hand over the keys of our Judaism to uh, a closed and stringent system. Uh, even if a lot of the work done within the Rabbanut is, is positive work, I don't think they should have a monopoly of a Jewish life uh, in Israel. And today we still don't have a conversion bill. We're still relying on an outdated system that we've mostly inherited from the Ottoman Empire. And I think that Israel needs to work out what it means to be a Jewish state. And the gateway to Judaism, the conversion process, has a very important role in that bigger question as well. Yes. Thank you. I move, I need, no, no, right? no, stay here, stay here. <laughs> so, before I go into questions. Yes, I have to see that. I, I'm a little outdated. So what has been the follow up? I have two questions. One is the follow up on Rogachova, on yeah. the Rogachova decision. What actually is percolating with that in the court? Um, and the second question that I have is actually just a kind of to stretch you to, to say, what do you think are the possibilities, both positive and negative? We heard the positive, but what might be the negatives of really radical decentralization? What do you see happens in 20, 30, 40 years? Radical decentralization is really, in many ways, a battle very familiar to me from the United States, right? Um, yeah. And it's an interesting model. It worked historically in the older Kahila system with its coercive powers and all sorts of other structures. It didn't work so well in the United States. I'm curious. Yeah. So the first question, what's happening with the Rogachova case? So we won the Rogachova case. That I, Rabbi I know Rogachova. So there were several cases, there were several different conversion courts within the Rogachova case. I represented conversions from Robin Nisim Karelis conversion court, Rabbi Steinzal's conversion mm -hmm. court. Some of the cases were solved before the case was solved. Some of the cases were left the final case. There were two conversion courts mentioned in the case. One is Rabbi Nisim Karelis, the other is Rabbi Frank, who doesn't have a very active uh, in Jerusalem. The unbelievable interpretation of the Ministry of Interior as a result of the Rogachova case is that the Rogachova case recognizes Rabbi Nisim Karelis's conversions but not other private Orthodox conversions, which is an impossible interpretation from a legal basis, but uh, it needs to be challenged in court. What's happened in the cases I've represented is that when there's been conversions from other cases, for example, like Giyur Kalahak converts Israelis. So the Regatrava case is less relevant to Giyur Kalahak conversions, and then we have a, a court precedent that they can be registered as Jews. But other conversion courts then file the case of the Ministry of Interior, the Ministry of Interior, Interior finds some other reason to give Israeli citizenship, and then we can't bring the case to court. It provides practical solutions to the converts, which is, which is good, which is positive. That's always what we want. 
but it find, makes it more difficult to challenge the fundamental wrong interpretation of the Ministry of Interior on the, the way it should, it should operate. Uh, talking about the, the future, as a halakhically observant Jew, I believe that the best option for the Jewish people is that people should go through a halakhic uh, conversion. I think that the current system has driven people away. It hasn't provided, even if it is, there is a centralized system uh, which provides uh, halakhic conversions, I think less people are converting than if we had a more diverse system. So I think if someone wants more people to complete a halakhic conversion, a decentralized system would probably be the better option just to increase the numbers. Uh, What's happened since Gyur Kalaha was founded is that more people are turning to Gyur Kalaha. I don't know the exact numbers in the non-Orthodox movements, but I know the people who have to choose between an Orthodox conversion, non-Orthodox conversion, then just the implications of a non-Orthodox conversion means that only some people recognize it, and a Orthodox conversion will be recognized by more people within the Jewish world, and to many people, that's the better option to choose as long as they have a more open and attentive approach. So I believe that the the different options in conversion will provide by themselves a solution. Israel, as opposed to the states, already has a kind of built-in melting pot. You, know, you have to enforce a melting pot for people to turn into part of the Israeli society and want to be part of the Jewish community and Jewish circle just by living in the state of Israel. So they're brought into the Jewish people just by being Israelis. So just providing them the options to complete that process by having the, the right and appropriate conversion courts to their needs I think will provide us the best solution possible uh, in 30 and 40 years time, even though there will always be some people within the ultra-Orthodox sphere who won't marry people who have gone through uh, the more liberal conversions. I think we just have to take that uh, as a given. But, but it's important to say that those people today are not marrying you know, more liberal Jews anyway. Okay. So it's not as if that's going to be a, a reality which is going to happen in 34 years time. That's, that's the situation now. Yeah, Dominic. Thank you very much for an excellent presentation. Uh, I'm Dominic Markle from Rome, Roman Catholic <laughs> priest. I know nothing, <laughs> so uh, I need to ask the basic questions. Um, I, if I reconstruct the scenario as somehow correct, the basic scenario, uh, there is a difference between uh, the criteria for the law of return and uh, the criteria for being halakhically Jewish. Mm -hmm. Uh, so there seems to be a, a, a basic issue, if I understand correctly. What are the basic, what what is the basic difference between these criteria? I understand that the Jewish father isn't enough for like actually being Jewish. Uh, are there other differences? There's there's two main differences between the the law return. There's similarities and differences. One difference is that there are two different articles within the law of return. There's an article making aliyah to Israel, immigrating to Israel as a Jew. And there's an article of immigrating to Israel as a relative of a Jew. There's different levels. It can be a child or a grandson. If you make Aliyah to Israel as a Jew, you're registered as a Jew. And the definition of Jew in the law is someone who was born to a Jewish mother or converted to Judaism. Now, I'll, I'll touch Allah. on that in a second. No, I'll touch on that in a second. No, not on that, but that's the second difference. So I'll just address the first difference first. Um, one of the things which, I, which I'm currently researching, and I've also filed some cases with people who are Jewish according to the law of return and probably are halakhically Jewish, but still not recognized as being Jewish by the, the Rabbanut, and that's where the databases and the DNA testing co comes into the picture. Someone who has made aliyah as a relative as a Jew will be able to make aliyah to Israel, but they're not halakhically Jewish. They won't be registered as in, by the Ministry of Interior, Interior as, a, as a Jew, and they will have to complete a conversion process to be eligible to get married in the, in the Rabbanut. So that's, that's one difference. The second difference is the definition of what is a Jew in the law of return. The law of return says someone is a Jew if they were born to a Jewish mother uh, or they converted and they do not have a different religion. So there's some different, and this was added in the 70s. The law of return is from the 50s. This was added in the 70s as a result of the Shalit case, I mean, with the whole uh, legal background. But um, so some different. For start, the conversion in the law of return is not necessarily a, um, uh, an Orthodox conversion. Reform and conservative conversions can uh, make you eligible to make Aliyah to Israel according to the law of return. Another difference is the way you check Judaism. There's slight differences between the Ministry of Interior and the Rabbanut on who would be defined as a Jew. Another interesting difference is 
the definition of not having a different religion. Because according to Judaism, you can never lose your Judaism. You can become a Jew, but then your descents, um, uh, Saim, will, will also uh, be Jewish. According to the law of return, you can lose your Judaism. So for instance, a case I, I represented was a, a, young, a young girl. She was coming to get married. She was in her early 20s. Um, and, um, and she was studying in a midrasha, a religious institution in Israel. And her grandmother had been uh, uh, baptized for to Christianity before she before her mother was born. So she was, and this was uh, like around the time of the I don't know if it was in the Holocaust or just before the Holocaust. But it was like Jew, Jews people not wanting to show that they're Jews, but because her grandmother had been baptized to another religion, that means her mother lost the definition of Judaism, and her the granddaughter wasn't considered to be Jews. Even the granddaughters studying in a midrashah in Israel. She wasn't recognized by the state of Israel as being Jewish. So we solved we solved the problem. I mean, we when you say that. studying in the Midrash, you mean she's an Orthodox girl. She's yeah. studying in an Orthodox yeah. religious yeshiva for girls. Yeah, she, her whole life is like Orthodox. Yeah. But this but wasn't the Rabbanut. The Rabbanut would have accepted her Judaism because halakhically she's Jewish. She's Jewish. This was the Ministry of Interior <laughs> taking the <laughs> <small> <laughs> interpretation. It's like the no, but the Ministry of Interior because for a it's long like the time it's the brother for, Daniel's. For for a long yeah, time, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. because for a long time, uh, Shas, um, uh, ultra orthodox um, party, had the Ministry of Interior, and therefore uh, the layers of clerk there they are actually appointees of Shas. Therefore, they I, I agree. Power. I agree with everything. This is mm-hmm. the case in the Ministry of Interior. For most cases, here it's actually the definition. I mean, the, the basic yeah. problem is the definition of the law. The law says someone is a Jew if they were born to a Jewish mother or converted and don't have another religion. So if you track that back, just as Judaism goes down generations, then losing Judaism goes down generations. The Ministry of Interior, if it wasn't such a bureaucratic, closed-minded organization, they may have provided her a solution, which we eventually found. She did a process called Hashavale Yadut, which is like, it, it kind of emulates mm-hmm. a conversion process. So they can say she's like, Kilu, Kilu, she converted. Probably no, but now would you, would you be able to marry a priest because of, you know, so they might, you see, I mean, the, the, Rabbanut, the, Rabbanut, to be fair, the Rabbanut recognized her Judaism. Okay. So, I mean, according to the Rabbanut, she was eligible to get married. The only reason she couldn't get married is because she wasn't registered as, Jew, as Jewish. So, the Rabbanut doesn't have jurisdiction. In the civil system. So, you have two yeah. different official authorities of the state of Israel who have two different definitions of, of who is a Jew. Of identity for the same citizen of Israel. Yeah, absolutely. And it's two, it's the Rabbanut, it's the religious authority, the Ministry of Interior, and sometimes within these organizations, there's also different interpretations. <laughs> it's even more complex than that. When it relates to conversion, the Ministry of Interior provides the, uh, the option to make Aliyat Israel according to the law of return, or to register as, Jew, as a Jew in the uh, population registry, while the Rabbanut provides the option to get married or, or divorce, and sometimes relates to burial as well and other implications of, of conversion. Yeah. Michael, you had a question. Can you unpack for us a little bit, what does it entail to go to undergo conversion in Giyul Kalachan? I'm asking it as an yep. ethnographer of Jewish conversion, doing field work in the statist rabbinic courts. So how does it look like? What is like meaning being welcoming or being lenient? What are they asked to become? Yeah, I think even within Giyul Kalacha, I mean, it is a more lenient conversion, but people like to use the words uh, kashuv, attentive, mechil, you know, or respectful. Uh, I think the main difference in Giyur Kalachat conversions is that it's more of a, it's a dialogue. It's not, I think the way conversions have become in a bureaucratic uh, government system, it's more like an acceptance committee. You know, if you want to go and live in a, in a certain village and you have to be accepted to the village, so it's three rabbis sitting in there and, and testing the converts. Uh, in Giyur Kalachai, it's more about, it's a discussion about how people view themselves within the Jewish community and the Jewish uh, world. And while people, when they come to the state conversion call, they're kind of practicing for a test. You know, do I remember the bracha? I, there, was a, there was one person I, I helped through the process who failed the bed din uh, because his girlfriend at the time didn't know how to, who was Jewish, didn't know how to explain what afrashat chala is. I think if we ask people within the religious sphere in Israel what afrashat chala is, 
most people won't know how to explain it. And, and, and he failed the thing. So people are kind of uh, preparing for a test. In Gyur Kalacha, then there is a process of studying for conversion. Obviously, this, they're expecting people to accept mitzvot. Uh, and to practice mitzvot. And to practice, I mean, it depends. When, when people say shmirat mitzvot, everybody means something different. Right. So in Gyur Kalacha, people are not expected to be part of an orthodox community. They're expected to care about Judaism and Jewish practice and Jewish tradition. And I think 100% of the people who want to convert to Judaism do care about Judaism. I mean, that's, that's the point. That's why they're turning to conversion. So um, it's a much more uh, open, attentive process. And it also realizes the different place people who are converting are coming from. So, for instance, someone with a kid in a non-Jewish uh, school and the kid already has a set of friends and you would uproot the kid from their school without the, even with, you know, putting aside the question of special needs. But that's not something that would be, uh, you know, they, that would, would, isn't a request which would be made in your color. You just helped me a lot now uh, to make the connection between late antiquity and contemporary mm -hmm. practices. Because the semantic sphere of the verb legayer in the second conjugation, mm -hmm. the active conjugation, what is the act of legayer to convert someone? So within um, Amoraic Palestinian uh, land of Israel until the third, fourth, maybe fifth century, you still have legayer as to guide someone through the process of conversion. Mm -hmm. Okay, while within the Bavli, or at least the latest layers of the Bavli, Legayer means to accept someone as a convert. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, it's still the, 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 the Bavli which is dominating the way we, the way Orthodox and ultra Orthodox mm -hmm. think today. And, and that's what and, and but I, I have said that the Giyur Kalacha is to a certain extent reviving yeah. the the Legayer of, of the Yerushalmi. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put it as Giyur Kalacha undermining the Babli in a, the, I mean, just a you know, political perspective. Mm -hmm. But I have heard from rabbis within Giyur Kalacha many times saying that we are not bringing people into the Jewish people because they're already part of the Jewish people. Yeah. What we're doing is allowing them to be halachically Jewish to complete the conversion process. We don't decide if they're part of the Jewish people, they're, they're, they're living here in the state of Israel, they're part of the Jewish community. Mm -hmm. um, I have two, two questions. The first is, I was so struck by um, hearing that Ra'am was the reason why the bill didn't pass, but it's also obvious if you don't talk to your coalition partners, all of them, you're going to fail. It's like a perfect case. And so I'm curious to know, um, I mean, right, it's like literally what a coalition means, but in all honest, I like it, in, in seriousness, I'm curious about um, what is conversion like for Muslims and for Christians of all denominations here in Israel? What's at stake for those religious authorities and does a place like E team have partners among those communities or is the rabbinu more in line with them sort of how do they fit in and with like how does thinking outside the box outside the jewish box sort of help us potentially solve some of these problems um, and the second is um, a few years ago the process for registering a child of a jewish mother uh, sorry an israeli mother um, outside of israel required not only proof of legal parentage, but also proof of biological parentage um, in the form of things like ultrasounds. And I'm curious to know um, sort of what was the conversation about that and how does that fit into the definitions of Jewishness? Okay, so the first question first on how conversion in Israel relates to non-Jewish communities in Israel, Muslims. I do not think that Ram was against the conversion bill as much as Ram being disappointed that some other bills were not passed and the conversion bill was a very good excuse because to kind of, um, how do you say, last <laughs> um, uh, of it to flex a muscle within, uh, within the coalition uh, because they weren't consulted with on other issues, not necessarily the conversion, the conversion issue. The general approach of non-Jewish communities in Israel is as long as you don't affect our conversion, uh, not conversion, our batedin, our religious uh, establishment, then you, know, you can do whatever you want with, uh, with the issue of conversion. Uh, Ram has strong ties with ultra-Orthodox parties. So that was an issue which was, I mean, was it important to them to some level to show we still have this alliance, which we're, which we're keeping. 
Uh, Itim works within the Jewish community, so Itim doesn't directly relate. I have friends within non-Jewish uh, courts, in the Bateh Adina Shari, in the Muslim courts, so sometimes I discuss these issues with them and there's some connections, but I don't think that they're directly affected uh, by a conversion court. One interesting thing that happened uh, when, the, when um, the opposition was fighting Matan Kahana's bill is that Betalel Smot the head of the Tzion of the Tea Party, he sent a letter to Mansour Abbas saying the bill is actually a plot. This is a real thing. He said the bill was a plot to convert Muslims to Judaism. <laughs> and it's actually a way of uh, turning uh, all Muslims in Israel to Jews. And there's really rabbis and all they want to do. Which is just, oh, God. Um, <laughs> it has some historical background. Because some of the, you know, in, in the 50s and the 60s, People mm-hmm. like Ben Tzvi, they had some fantasies. Because they about, believed that they were the original... Yeah, yeah, uh, about converting Palestinians right. into Judaism, and they believed that the Palestinians they are actually yeah. the real descendants of those right. who, who stayed They've here after. They've got the gene. The gene question. Just, but just politically, yeah. I mean, I'm, I mean, the, the political <laughs> legal world, the thought of, of uh, kind of um, rabbis from religious Zionist communities sacrificing <laughs> their position within the religious Zionist in the Zionist world to convert Muslims. I don't think that would have passed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Bezalel Smotrich was not basing his letter on... On Ben Svi. On Ben no, Svi. No, no. No. Uh, the second thing about the Ministry of Interior, I'm not sure I'm familiar with the, with the case. There was a case I represented where a Israeli Jewish mother re- registered as Jewish could not register her kids as, as Jews because the Ministry of Interior doubted her Jewish identity because there was some documents. Uh, so I don't know if that's the case. When I went to register my children when they were already um, old, like 10 years after they were born, um, and I went, um, I was not the only person, everyone there who was wanted to register as the child of an Israeli, mo- a Jewish Israeli mother, um, and I brought their birth certificate. They said, this proves that you are their mother legally, but where is your proof that you actually bore these children? And I had to go home and bring ultrasounds and, and hospital bracelets. Yeah. And the and, and they bureaucracy. But but it, it but they said to me, I said it's so strange that this is the case. And they said it's a new law of just two years ago. Um, and um and, and this was in New York. Um, and I was not the only one. There was someone in his um, late 20s there who had returned with his own hospital bracelet from 27 years ago in order to get his citizenship. Who um, keeps the bracelet? This is not an Israeli story. I'm trying to get papers now. I'm trying to get correct my birth certificate in New York in order to perhaps like, be able to file here. I have to, I'm 70 years old, I right? I have to find my vaccination records from when I am. No, 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 but they, they literally they said that it was because <laughs> they, they could prove that they were my children, but they couldn't prove that they were Jewish because if I had um, adopted them at the hospital, their birth certificate would have still said my name on them. And so it was literally a biological definition of Jewish. I, I understand I, that. I'm just saying that there's so much of a status yeah. bureaucratic yeah. aspect of this. I'm trying to change the word female to my proper name. My six-year-old, my vaccinations from when I'm six, and otherwise I can't do it. But this, this is it. This the, is new as a. The, the Minister of Interior <laughs> is a very difficult uh, government body to work with on on all, many very different correct. issues, uh, especially in Minister of Interior. There's Rashid Rosin Bagira. We're in charge of these issues, and it, and it's a challenge. And Shas has been there for a long time, and a lot of the clerks uh, come with this very narrow and stringent and bureaucratic viewpoint mixed together with a kind of uh, ultra, ultra, I don't know if orthodox is the right definition, but stringent interpretation of Judaism. Uh, I don't think it's a law that passed. There may be some kind of resolution within the Ministry of Interior guidelines. I, I mean, I'd love to read more about it just to understand how it connects to other things happening uh, within the Ministry of Interior. One thing that has developed over the past decade in the Ministry of Interior and the Rabbanut as well is the whole question of how we uh, know people, it's a, it's a, it's a halachic, but mostly an epi- epistemological question on how we know people were born Jewish. 
So if the, I mean, the original, if we go back to the 50s, the question is, who is a Jew? Is, you know, do we accept people who are Jewish from their father? In the 70s and 80s, the conversion issue started. You know, how do we know people who are, uh, went to an Orthodox uh, halachic conversion? Now the question is more an epistemic question of how do we know that someone was born Jewish? And many people coming from the former Soviet Union specifically, but this may affect other places in the world, uh, just because they're, 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 they, uh, a question which keeps coming up is, you know, were you really born to your mother? And even to the extent that I represented a case where someone was asked to bring proof if his grandmother was really born to his great grandmother. And they were but questioning. It's not enough to make a DNA test. If well, they were, uh, this sure. is the thing. So they, I mean, so they were, yeah. So they were asked to go for it in this case. So in this case, he was asked to bring proof that his grandmother was really his, the daughter of his great grandmother. The great grandmother was, was dead. Great grandmother was the only daughter. So how do you bring a DNA, a DNA test? He was asked to go, to, uh, to go and check if his DNA was connected to all sorts of cousins' DNAs. <laughs> and it's it's an unbelievable process. Um, and yeah, and then looking at, at gravestones and uh, <laughs> hospital documents and pictures of the family. But um, it's really, I mean, according to Jewish halacha, if a mother testifies that her kids are not really her kids, then according to halacha, you don't necessarily believe her testimony because you want to keep the integrity of the family. I mean, there's the whole concept in Jewish halacha of mishpacha shenitme'a nitme'a, someone who's been integrated into mm -hmm. Jewish community and Jewish society. We do everything in our power not to push them out. Yeah. This has been turned on its head within the... <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yesterday, yesterday, just we touched upon Yakir, the concept of recognizing your son, and, and there was this weird sentence that, uh, he, he, his testimony disqualified himself, but not okay, his offspring. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly this, yeah. okay? Which is absurd, yeah. 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 But, but the whole yeah. thing, I have to cut it yeah, I'm here. sorry, <laughs> <laughs> because we want to listen to Michal as well. But, but the good news is that Elad is staying with us for lunch. And we have lunch downstairs in the house. And we can just go down and continue this conversation all together after uh, Michal's presentation. So thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Can you yeah. I would just add, I was approached by several people who knew that I'm working on conversion, and they asked for my advice. They wanted to convert to Islam because there are more available kids for uh, adoption that are Muslims, and it's much easier. So they're like, oh, adoption is perfect. Yeah, so yeah, I interesting. I'm actually working on something related to that. Okay, more yeah. interesting. Yeah. So uh, let me introduce uh, Michal Kaveltovi, who is a cultural anthropologist at Tel Aviv University. She works at the intersection of political anthropology, the ethnography of religion, and Jewish studies. Her projects include failed messianism among Chabad Hasidism, another mm -hmm. fascinating topic in my opinion, mm -hmm. state-run Jewish conversion in Israel, the construction of a demographic crisis among, among American Jewry, mm -hmm. and last but not least, emerging Me Too activism among Haredi Jews in Israel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Amazing. Her book, When the State Winks, the, per the Performance of Jewish Conversion in Israel, received in 2018 the second prize of the Clifford Gertz Prize Award of the American Anthropological nice. Association, and won in the same year the Jordan Schnitzer Book Award of the Association of Jewish Studies. Kolekha mm -hmm. Buddha. Right. We thank you very warmly for your contribution to this conference and for bringing your anthropological perspective <laughs> into our discussion. I'm a foreigner here, right? Uh, I'm very happy to join me today, and I'm sorry I couldn't do it uh, yesterday. The bulk of my work is actually an ethnographic documentation of real life, like real encounters in the conversion interface, meaning I joined conversion pants for two years and I joined tens and tens of conversion procedures in different courts in Israel, in Belshev, in Kriyat Gat, in Jerusalem, in Tel Aviv, in different places, and joined the ritual birth mikveh. And I also interviewed people. But because of the framing of this uh, uh, this workshop about the status, I decided to talk about the ways in which the conversion agents perceive and imagine and envision and think about and feel about converts. Um, in many ways, both Matan and Elad are my natives. They're like differently positioned people who are 
within this field. Uh, some of what I'm going to say, I think may be redundant at this stage. So just say it quickly and we will have more time for discussion, if you will. Okay. The idea that religious conversion constitutes an unsettling event has figured prominently in the rich scholarship on the subject. Across various settings, scholars have demonstrated how conversion disturbs and disrupts demographic ideals of the nation, how it desecrates bureaucratic categories and precipitates, and precipitates deep uh, political rifts within the national form. This is the case, for example, in works on post-colonial secular India, where conversion to Islam defies the Hindu nature of the country, or in the new Europe, where converts to Islam in Germany or Denmark have been growingly perceived as polluting, ambiguous, and dangerous in nature. Conversion in this context is a conversion to otherness, a move that has come to breed political sentiments and shape anxious interventions. But what do we make of conversion to sameness, of inclusive politics and policies of conversion? Based on an ethnographic study of view in contemporary Israel, I've been working actually in 2004, 2007. Mm -hmm. I will point at the settling rather than unsettling ambitions and logics that underwrite conversion. At the center of these dynamics, one can find Olim from the, from the FSU, who are not deemed Jewish according to Jewish law, and are colloquially known as Olim Elo and Yudim, non Jewish Olim. By, occupying ambiguous spaces of national belonging within the Jewish form as incomplete insiders, invisible outsiders, and deserving citizens all at once, non-Jewish olim from the FSU interrupt the bureaucratic logic, meaning the taxonomic order of Israeli Jewish identity. Against this backdrop, the state-run Jewish conversion project crystallized as a national mission during the 1990s, and it was coined as such only in 2003. This project can be understood, the National Mission Project, can be understood as a settling corrective mechanism geared towards both orderly classification of unclassifiable citizens and a stately morally justified token of gratitude to the newcomers and their families. Conversion is an act of repair, and it is also a gift from the state to its citizens. While the state has long subsumed the Ur under its control and already built some uh, infrastructures of funds and courts during the 1970s, it was only in the wake of extensive waves of non-Jewish FSU immigration since the late 1980s, estimated as Matan say to be by now by around a half a million, that the Israeli state has fully taken upon itself the prerogative of conversion, including all the administrative and financial responsibilities conversion implies. For the first time, the Israeli state crafted a pro-conversion policy aimed at converting as many as possible non-Jewish olim, and we heard this discourse about numbers and their family members, fully subsidizing the conversion school and the conversion procedure at the rabbinic court. Why have non-Jewish olim catalyzed this intensive and extensive state involvement? Non-Jewish Olim are situated betwixt and between two Israeli legal systems, as you just asked, positioned as a result as both insiders and outsiders. These subjects are embraced as citizens by virtue of Jewish kinship, but are not recognized as Jews religiously. On the one hand, they arrived in Israel under the law of return and are fully eligible for immediate citizenship and financial support upon their arrival. Whether they are offspring of Jewish fathers or people with more remote ties to Jews, they immediately become fully fledged Israeli citizens. On the, on the other hand, these olim are not Jewish according to the matrilineal principle of Jewish law and are deprived thus of basic civil rights as they are neither registered as Jews in the census nor were entitled to state monopolized religious services. Hence, both symbolically and bureaucratically, these immigrants frustrate the Israeli social and legal greed. It is hard to overemphasize the idiosyncratic privilege mode of inclusion that the law of return secures. This is particularly clear when it is compared to the other significantly weaker legislative arrangements that govern immigration to Israel, the citizenship and entry to Israel law. 
the law of return is the only mode of belonging in Israel that is based on a sacred sense of entitlement and the mythic narrative of Zionist redemption. However, given the religious halachic, <coughs> sorry, given the religious, the religious halachic status of non-Jewish olim, this insiderness is inherently partial. The implication is that in relationship to key processes in which boundaries and categories of the Jewish nation state are policed, marriage, burial, non-Jewish olim are positioned outside uh, of the fold. To further confuse these legislative inconsistencies, the assimilation of non-Jewish olim within Jewish Israeli society is both invisible and profound, giving way in the process to cultural anxieties about physical illegibility and the tenuous boundaries of Jewish collectivity. Uh, even if non-Jewish olim were categorized for many years as others within the Israeli census, in a social sense, their otherness is indiscernible. They may have a stereotypical Jewish look or have a Jewish family name, and they often practice Jewish holidays. They are clearly unmarked by external signs of otherness, like skin color or language, that might differentiate them from other FSU olim as non-Jews. Instead, they blend with the various Jewish Israeli populations, including FSU Jewish populations, and inevitably become romantically and socially involved with kosher real Jews. Indeed, intermarriage, usually alarmist trope pervasive among diasporic Jewish communities, is one of the gravest anxieties that FSU immigration has sparked within Zionist and religious circles in Israel. Throughout their in uh, evitable daily uh, integration or simply put sociological conversion, these immigrants evade the clear categories of social difference in Israeli society. Since 2002, when the nationality clause on Israeli ID cards was nullified, the non-Jewishness of these immigrants has become even less immediately exposed. Their indistinctive, invisible outsiderness complicates the everyday social engagement of, of Israeli Jews with the question of who is a Jew. As one of the conversion teachers explained to me in a tone that conveyed both annoyance and embarrassment, it's not written on their forehead. So how can one tell if someone is a Jew? Sometimes you hear a family name that sounds very Russian, very non-Jewish, but the person turns out to be Jewish. Or take Schwarz. It sounds Jewish, but no. You think you know, but you mm -hmm. can't know. Like this like invisible passing uh, triggers so much anxiety. To um, illustrate how state-run conversion is construed as a corrective mechanism against this confusion, let me examine the attainable conversion Giyur Barasaga campaign jointly launched in 2014 by the Ministry of Religious Service and the Prime Minister's Office. Under the slogan, today more than ever, attainable conversion, the state appealed to non-Jewish FSU immigrants over the radio, Facebook, and YouTube, and promised them that conversion would be an achievable goal with a more considerate and lenient process. Panning meaningfully on the slogan, attainable housing, the Yorba Saga, Mm. popularly uh, yeah. associated in Israel with the social protest movement of the summer of 2011, the yeah. government implied that Israelis should understand conversion just like housing, as a public service that the, the state offers its uh, citizens. The this campaign targeted <laughs> Russian-speaking Israeli citizens was neither new nor in any way disguised. No less conspicuous than its Russian target was the attainable conversion campaign's unmistakably gender nature. You can mm. see that. Mm. Although it made, and uh, Matan said is very, very clear. Mm. Although it made no explicit reference to gender, women were clearly the campaign's primary target. The theme of national belonging typified the campaign narrative. You see, like they need to piece together all those uh, this puzzle. The, the theme of national belonging typified the campaign narrative. The women it foregrounded were clearly troubled by their and their future children's pro problematic belonging. The conversion uh, advertisement offered them a tangible opportunity for full and secure belonging stamped with the authority of the state. 
What secular liberal Jews in Israel, like myself, may characterize as a too enthusiastic, even missionary effort to draw immigrants into an orthodoxly mediating religious inclusion, conversion agents, most of whom hail from religious Zionist circles like Matan, perceive as a morally justified mission undertaken on behalf and for the benefit of those immigrants. The goal in employing a moral discourse is the social production of public compassion, commitment and care regarding the national problem writ large and towards non-Jewish elim themselves. You are loved and wanted here, wrote Rabbi Israel Rosen in a religious Zionist right-wing journal, thus distilling both descriptively and prescriptively the emotional and moral core of the conversion project. Why does Rabbi Rosen love non-Jewish FSU immigrants? <laughs> Why are these immigrants worthy of his and us and more broadly of the state and society's love? The answers to these questions relate to the moral economy that inspires the conversion and national mission. This moral economy conceptualizes non-Jewish FSU immigrants not only as subjects of return and Jewish solidarity, but also as wealthy Israeli citizens who are morally entitled to Jewish belonging and recognition in and by the Israeli state. Israel, meanwhile, is given the opportunity to construe itself as a good, generous, grateful, and moral Jewish state. I heard numerous articulations of this moral economy from rabbis and conversion agents throughout my fieldwork. To begin with, so this logic goes, Non-Jewish immigrants deserve a relatively friendly conversion process, facilitated and subsidized by the state, because they are related through kinship ties to the Jewish people. Many of them have Jewish ancestors, and some of them are even considered the seed of Israel, Zara Israel, a category describing the offspring of Jewish fathers and grandfathers. This halakhic concept reinforces the importance of returning Jewish and Israeli morality. The idea that Jews have an unlimited burden of responsibility for all the dispersed and lost parts of the family. And this burden does not end with the law of return, but continues with conversion. In addition, these non-Jewish immigrants deserve the state's effort because they suffered as Jews in the Soviet Union. In this sense, their, conver their conversion draws on a sense of a shared history of suffering. If anti-Semitism, communism, and the Soviet terror took little notice of halakhic boundaries, so the argument goes, why should the Jewish state enforce them now? To the extent that these immigrants sought refuge from a political regime that coerced them into assimilation, intermarriage, and identity loss, they are not considerate they are not considered responsible for or guilty of their predicament. Hence, they should be treated as more than converses, as more than unseen. And the Jewish state should redress the injustices of the Soviet state. This is our national responsibility, our society's responsibility, according to one senior official. We are responsible for these people. It's not their fault that they are not Jewish. It's not because they chose to abandon the faith, but because of what happened in the communist countries during those years. One of them told me it's only uh, arbitrary that I'm Jewish and she isn't, you know, it couldn't be all the way around. Um, many of the conversion agents I met employed kinship metaphors to describe the sense of responsibility that drives them. In giving voice to this genealogical imagination, they reflect the uh, existential anxiety and forms of solidarity that so uh, characterize the post-Holocaust Jewish, Jewish experience. They also reflect the idea that kinship, as uh, anthropologist Don Simon argues, is broad and flexible enough as an idiom to encompass multiple formations of belonging. For example, my interlocutors often spoke about our brothers and sisters or our own flesh and blood in the face of historical circumstances that arbitrarily determine who would remain a halachic Jew and who would not, the conversion agents appeal to both the essential logic of biological relatedness and the historical or mythical story of the extended family, Jewish family. 
as Rebbe Yiram, a senior staff member at one conversion school, you probably know him, and I explained to me, what guides me are the words of Rebbe Chaim Druckmann when he became the head of the conversion administration. He told, he said, you need to think as if the convert is your cousin, your nephew, your brother. What would you do then? That is exactly what you will do for the convert. From the perspective of these conversion agents, kinship metaphors help frame the conversion as an internal Jewish affair. It represents for them a project of return or a constitutive moment of the ingathering of the exiles, as opposed to an outwardly directed missionary endeavor. As Benny E. Shalom, the founding chairperson of Mali, explained to me in an interview, I did not see it as a missionizing, because I do not view these people as outsiders. They are not Gentiles, as I see. They are our brothers and sisters. Something happened during the course of Jewish history. Intermarriage happens not only in Russia. How do I know that I myself am not a descendant of conversos or of the Khazars? Apart from their Jewish ancestry or history, non-Jewish immigrants are often given credit for the fact that they have chosen to link their fate to that of, to that of the Jewish people in its homeland. They are presented as active and productive Israeli citizens in social, economic, and national domains who fulfill their civic obligations. The state's moral obligation to welcome the conversion of such immigrants is predicated to a large extent on ethno-national and republican notions of citizenship that require the, the state to give back to, uh, contri to contributing citizens. Conversion in, the, in this sense is based on mutual exchange between the state and its citizens. Because the routine moral system of exchange that binds Jewish Israeli citizens to the Israeli state depends heavily on the high masculine domain of military service, Public discourses about conversion frequently highlight the figure of the soldier, especially the combat soldier, even when most converts are female. The heated debate over the burial of, of non-Jewish immigrant soldiers is evidence of what the Israeli public conceptualizes as an imbalanced, imbalanced relationship with, between the state and its citizens, and in, in tolerable gap between inclusion and inclusion, giving and receiving. In the framework of Israel's economy of sacrifice, Israelis demonstrate civic virtue when they enlist in the army. It is difficult to imagine a higher form of civic belonging, a more precious gift to the state. In this context, the equation between citizens as soldiers and citizens as converts, and between giving to the state and the state giving back we sound strongly. Conversion becomes a moral debt of the state. The national mission is rooted in the efforts of state agents and institutions to take moral and national responsibility for the sake of the collective, the Zionist state, state and the future of non-Jewish Olim as complete insiders and deserving citizens. Thank you. And now we're can you tell about the drama of sincerity within the court? So, I mean, by the way, questions. Let me say something about the sincerity of the court. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to hear that. Yeah. That's a surprising question. <laughs> 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 Did you invite this question? <laughs> <laughs> so, this is what everybody is preoccupied about all the time. And they actually use like everyone all the time. Like when I go to conversion schools or when I go to the conversion Arabian court and like behind the scenes when converts talk about and they want an inside information for me as someone who has been to the conversion court, you know, what kind of sincere performance they are looking for. So this is really what they're bothered about. And they have different notions of what sincerity means. And teachers all the time, cautious students don't have don't let conversion agents, the, the conversion of uh, judges, have a sense of you as someone who has a sincerity problem. So this is all the time. At the same time, converts or candidates suspect that the conversion agents have themselves sincerity problem <laughs> because they only talk to us about 
acceptance of the commandments and about religious mm -hmm. uh, morality, but they, in fact, believe in the national mission. Mm -hmm. And they actually yes, exactly. engage in a kind of this, like, you know, mm -hmm. they won't use this concept, but, but they engage in this biopolitical project. They want as many of us and as young mm -hmm. as possible. They want us to bear Jewish children. So they won't tell us <laughs> that their Zionist hats, you know, that they wear simultaneously is what actually drove them you know, to fulfill their role as conversion agents. So like converts look back. And as uh, Elad just said, the conversion procedure is very much like a legal interrogation. It's not enough for uh, agents, for the uh, rabbis to just ask, do you accept the commandments? No. Do you want to be a Jew? They dissect every hour of the day to make sure that it's filled and fulfilled by religious commandments. Okay, so you light the candles. So what was the time last week when you did it, right? And you do Avdala. How long does it take to do an Avdala? They ask them to recite prayers, to know that they are really conversant in the prayer. They check all the time, does the keeper sit well on his head? Does she look like she really understand our religious women we're alike? Um, they bring all kinds of testimony to the court, right? To make sure that the narrative that, that, like, that, that was presented by the convert is the sincere one. So they would ask me, the ethnographer, what do you think, Michal? Did she tell, did you suspect anything about that it was not <laughs> like, like if someone, for example, wrote, they have to write their own narrative in a, a portfolio. But if it was written in a too high language, like the, the lingo was not a good fit to who she presented herself as someone who's been in Israel only four years. So like it raised some uh, suspicions. They asked letters from the Gabbai that he saw them, which is problematic for women because women much less go to shul to begin with. And when they do, they go to a Zolat machine. So teachers would instruct converts to stand behind the shul outside, wave to the goodbye, to make sure that you see them, <laughs> and then be sure. A mishpacha me'arach at hosting family. So the hosting family itself needs to be sincere, right? Like, I cannot provide my family as a host family because I don't, you know, I live as a secular Jew. So this family needs to be presenting itself as orthodoxy related enough. Uh, the, the, the spouse in, in herself or himself, usually it's himself, because most converts are female, also need to present himself as a willing, eager Jew. So he may have a narrative of, you know, I grew up religiously, I took some distance, I got confused, I went to <laughs> India, but now I'm back. I'm back and I'm willing to cooperate and dream and envision and maintain a religious a family life. Um, <laughs> this is a long story. <laughs> yeah. So, because you are an ethnographer, I, I prefer to start with a story before asking. <laughs> so, uh, in, in our very uh, liberal, semi egalitarian, uh, orthodox, um, um, middle class uh, synagogue in Zichon Yaakov. Which is yours. It's mine, yeah. Recently, we, uh, we are saying a prayer for the citizens of Ukraine. And uh, last Shabbat, uh, the only non-Ashkenazi Yemenite member of our community said, why didn't you say a prayer to the citizens of Syria just seven years mm -hmm. ago? Mm -hmm. and, and I think that uh, the question of mm -hmm. almost, we can say, European colon colonization project should be raised here uh, in two aspects. One, it is we, Europe, Ashkenazi, um, middle class, well-off people, Matan, Elad, myself, we are working towards the conversion of those fellow Europeans. The white Jews. Mm -hmm. First, against the Palestinians. And second, uh, it's not coincidental that Shas, which is the Eastern ultra-Orthodox um, uh, cler clerks who, holds, who still hold Misrad Apnim, the Ministry of Interior, <coughs> are those who are fighting this tendency. So, it, so to what extent in your studies you have noted that this perception of, 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 of the national conversion project is, is expressed, sensed, understood by anyone within the actual mm -hmm. field? Okay. So... 
It was present in a very sophisticated, meaning implicitly implicit way. Uh, most of the rabbis are religious Zionists, besides two or three were of Ashkenazi background. Mm -hmm. uh, they define themselves as soldiers of the national mission. Uh, and they take it as a given that mm -hmm. you know those newcomers are white. So you could see traces of these gaps that you are alluding to in the ways in which, for example, they related to Ethiopian Jews. Mm -hmm. I, you know, it wasn't my focus, but I did observe maybe 10 or 20 cases of Ethiopian Jews. The whole procedure is different. It's not an individual. Like the whole legal infrastructure is, diff is different to begin is different to begin with. But also, it's not an individual Ethiopian Jew who stands before them and being scrutinized. It's the whole family. It's the one among. So the whole perception of who is entitled, like you know, is demarcated differently when there are possibly black Jews and and it's not only about being white and black, it's also I think about meaning of class and education. So they talk all the time about those citizens, like as I was saying, deserving. I want him inside. I want mm -hmm. him inside. Like he's already inside, but I want him because he will make Israel better. Mm -hmm. Um <laughs> no, there's, there, I think there's three main groups of people who today go through the conversion process. One group is Jews from the former Soviet Union who have made Aliyah. Another group is Ethiopian Jews uh, from mostly Falashmura who go through a process called Gyol Khumra, which is more lenient. So just to kind of challenge the narrative, the, well, it, like, the black Jews are going through a more lenient, open process than Jews coming from the former Soviet Union. And the third group, which is also a large group, is Israelis, mostly uh, Mizrahim, who are marrying non-Jews. And the non-Jewish partner, usually the woman, goes through the conversion in the conversion process. And that's also not a white European narrative. So to focus the, all of conversion only on the former Soviet Union, I think would, is, is wrong today in Israel. There's a wider question of a more uh, dynamic world where people are traveling from both places, <laughs> meeting people who are not necessarily Jewish. So we have to look at like the, I mean- you, what, what, What's the demographic breakdown of those three groups? Like it's what about percentage? a third, it's about a third each, I'd say. No, the Mizrahi is maybe a, a fifth, yeah. But yeah. I, I wanna add something to that because the demographic is important and going back to the discussion of the being half pregnant, there's something that we're not we're ignoring. The demographic of people who went through the conversion to reform or conservative, and then they approach and they say, we want to be kosher, according to you. Mm -hmm. They get a speedy yeah. conversion. Why? Why would they get a speedy conversion? Because the Rabbanud are afraid that they're half pregnant. That's the problem, right? They know that according to the halakha, it's enough to have three people present. They know that this is illegal. If, if they went through, especially in the conservative movement, if they went through a bedding of three men, it's very simple to convert. I know, I converted. I think, not, not myself, I, I participated in a conversion, in a pirate uh, conversion process, and uh, it's very easy to do it. You take three men and you convert, and it's, it's very simple to do. So they know it, that halakhically speaking, those people are Jewish. And they're in limbo. They're half pregnant. So they make it, they do it super fast for them. So that's another demographic that no one talks about because it's either black or white. Either you convert according to us, according to the cloth, according to the laws or not. But then if you come half pregnant, we'll rush you through it. So the flow of is, 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 is a little bit related to that. So that's something to, by the way, if someone asks me about this, there was a period that I, that I, that I dealt with that. When someone asks me, I say, go straight away. The conservative movement, do that through them, and then join the system when you're half pregnant because the system will treat you differently. Okay, I, I just like to continue a bit. Um, it may be lenient, like in formality, but in real life, like all Fashmua need to undergo. So it's much more structured. Like there is no assumption that like one should be asked about whether he wants to be returned or to be embraced or to be. Uh, I have a story, one story about a convert from South France. She was not from Paris, right? And they were so amazingly, and now she's from Ashdod, right? So they were like amazingly arrogant about her, like in the way in which they asked her about Alachi questions. Like, you know, they coming from all the three rabbis were from Kazarab. And they were like asking her as if they were deliberating with her about Alachi, knowingly that she is not, you know, 
אני רק בהתחלה, אני רק מנסה, and they were like speaking with her from above in ways that I did not see when they did, when they were speaking with a convert from Spain who came after her art, or even after those intellectual Russians who actually they suspecting them more for being insincere because they came from atheist regime and they're post-Soviet subjects, so they know a thing or two about lying to the state, right? So <laughs> you, said, you said Southern France? Right. And what, and what was her social context? Why did she come? She made Aliyah, she was a non-Jewish Ole, but from France and not from... So Africa. it was a class issue in a she very... From Maghreb or... I mean, that, is that what you're saying? That it was really was a class a issue? Of, with Southern France. <laughs> no, no, no. I guess, no, no, I'm <laughs> saying it to... So I'm was she, to was, position her was in this low class. Yeah, was yeah. She was because was she originally from North class Africa. Issue. Yes, yes. Her father was a many, Jew from many, North Africa? Yeah. Yeah. Many, many, probably, no. probably her father was a Jew from North Africa. Right, or? but she lived many years, she's French, like yeah, she lived yeah. all her life, but like I'm saying South France, like as opposed to someone who comes from like intellectual Paris. Yeah. So mm-hmm. they like, knew all the time that she was a separate Jew and the way in which they approached her was extremely, extremely arrogant. Mm-hmm. And they even like even later told something like joking about it. Mm-hmm. So Dominique and the question. So Dominique. <laughs> You're shocked. <laughs> I'm trying to, to ask a question which I find difficult. And of course, I'm speaking as an outsider. And I'm, uh, I hope uh, you believe me that I'm doing it with empathy and respect. Uh, but I'm trying to, to understand things. And so asking a major question. So one thing is my overall perception. Um, this question obviously is about not just that some 500,000 people, but about um, who are we as Israeli society, inclusion, exclusion. Mm-hmm. And of course, there are enormous tensions. I hear that more than half of the society now is totally secular. Mm-hmm. I don't know whether this is correct, but this is what I hear. Mm-hmm. You, you would have an answer. Half, half the Israeli society, 50% of the Israelis are secular? Yeah. De- define secular. Yeah. You know, like yeah. Yeah. No, no. Yeah. 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 There, there is all spectrum. Sort of atheist. No, 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 no. no. secular. This, no. Not okay, okay. this is not the, the term it used. Oh, but certainly not orthodox. Yes. No, um, right. Not orthodox, not ultra orthodox. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Right. Now, mm-hmm. so yeah. I guess that most of those people. <laughs> Maybe half of the society, most of, uh, let, let's say, half of the society would not, um, would not um, stand, live up to the prerequisites of converts. Exactly. So, uh, and they would probably not find that very reasonable what is going on there about <laughs> conversion. <laughs> the one attempt that was made well, by Yossi Bailey <laughs> to have a secular conversion failed. And in general, secular, you know, we can argue about the numbers, but in general, and I think it's a problem of us seculars, has given the keys to handling their Jewish identity to the state, delivered, right, or subcontracted yeah. by religious Zionist or Haredi groups. Yeah. So conversion is just part of this package, just part of part of this like broader deal. But yes, they won't agree. And many times I heard from converts, why are you Jewish and you do nothing, right? And I need to, I do not need to to, to prove anything. And in my dreams, I was you know, coming back again and again to being asked to undergo a conversion. Yes. And so, so this is uh, not so Nightmare, difficult. Nightmare, I would say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, sorry, I'm trying to ask a more difficult question. Okay. So, um, this is, let's say, a general tension within society would say that I perceive. Uh, then we are dealing with two areas, let's say, of, uh, or how did Eisenstadt and Giesen call it, um, codices of uh, inclusion or exclusion. That is the primordial, the analogical, on the one hand, and the what they called cultural in the narrow sense, that is the religious aspect of uh, inclusion and exclusion. And somehow it seems that the, what the official state is trying to do is to combine both criteria, 
both uh, play a role and somehow both need to be given uh, be a given but of course in either area uh, it's not so clear where the criteria really have to be strong and i'm trying to ask a question about the i think a major issue that we have not really it has popped up but we have not re really addressed it the the genes question uh, and i think you're working on that too and uh, I think some uh, here in the room reacted a bit nervously <laughs> when it came up. And um, my perception would be that the, this nervous reaction has to do with the troubled history of this concept. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's uh, very much uh, an idea that the Nazis uh, played through uh, very systematically. And of course, we all know that uh, the state of Israel culturally is built to a large degree upon the cultural trauma of the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. And I'm using cultural trauma as a sociological term, not as a psychological, I'm not pathologizing the state, but I'm using it as a cultural, uh, as a sociological term. Um, and of course it also has, everything has socio-psychological dimensions. So, um, as an outsider, as an, with empathy, I fear that what Freud would have called latency and the return of the neurosis uh, may be playing out in those areas. And of course, those things are always repressed and subconscious and may be difficult for society and individuals. So I'm trying to ask, the question, a difficult question, open. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what the question is. Can I, 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 I just, well, sorry. Sorry, go ahead. No, just, just I think it's such an, I think it's mm -hmm. one of the elephants in the room. And I think that my sense as a medieval historian who knows nothing about anything that we're discussing, so just, is that some of what you're saying is going on, but it's more complicated than that because these concepts within Judaism go back centuries and millennia before the Nazis and before mm -hmm. any of what we are now burdened with anthropologically and sociologically and psychologically at the same time. So they have new resonance and complexity and sort of dialogicalness mm -hmm. now, so you think but so? these issues go way back deep into antiquity and so so yes but kind of or yes and mm -hmm. and then the only other thing I would say because I've for random reasons been looking at some scientific articles about DNA work on Jewish populations mm -hmm. is that it's quite striking how depending on what Jewish population you're talking about whether you're looking at a North African area or an Eastern European population or a Yemenite population many of those individuals have a lot more in common genetically with non-Jews in those parts of the world cool. than with mm -hmm. Jews from another part of the world. Yeah. And so we're not just, talk, I mean, this is a universal issue, but you look at genetically, Yemenite Jews are much closer to non-Jewish Yemenites than to Ashkenazi Jews. No, they might the, the, the Yemenite. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, I, 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 okay. It's another, uh, so, but in general, I didn't. I understand the Yemenite case is, is unique in many different. ways. Yes. I just mean if you take yes. most mm -hmm. different geographically, you know, Jewish communities who lived in a place for centuries start to look genetically more like the non-Jews around them than like Jews from a completely different geographic location. And so I know there are certain chromosomal markers that can persist within communities and across those communities. But there are other things that come up when one does DNA work that maybe are less welcome. Um, <laughs> you have become nervous because of the gene talk, but if we had had this conversation in the USA, we wouldn't have been nervous, right? DNA tests are extremely popular among all kinds of populations, include aspiring Jews or those who find you, and all kinds of like even distant groups like the Lemba in South Africa and Zimbabwe or other groups in Brazil, they all draw on the language and authority of DNA mm -hmm. to reconnect to this like extended family. And this is why I think that, you know, you separated between the primordial and the religious, but, you know, along like Jewish history, and I'm not an historian, but even like across like different cultural contexts where Jews or people want to be Jews, like live as Jews, 
like all these kind of intersections between primordiality and religion, you know, takes different shapes, like in the US context, in the European context, and in Israel. So I don't think that like those conversion uh, agents that I met here let go of the primordial, like, you know, if they had you, if they had been, they wouldn't have used so extensively and be so dependent on the kinship idiom, which is so central and dear to what they're thinking they are doing. At the same time, they have to look at, at themselves at the mirror and in their coalitions, political coalitions, and behind their back where the Haredi, you know, public figures look at them, and they also need to adhere to Jewish law, however taken. So, you know, like they must bring all those aspects together. And this is just one complicated, you know, intersection among many, many others, I think. Um, but like I heard your comment as, as a comment, not as a question. This is why I, I was asking to make sure that I understand what you're asking me. Um, well, 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 sure. I, 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 well, of course, it's, 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 a, it's a kind of an attempt to frame uh, or, or, or give a look at a larger framework of an issue of Israeli uh, society and uh, self-revision or sociological issues and, and you reacted to it, but uh, also uh, maybe uh, it would be interesting to hear uh, what Ella, Ella uh, uh, is thinking as you're working on these issues. Yeah. I, I mean, I have a lot to say on the DNA issue. I mean, it's a whole issue in itself, but I think connecting it to the conversion issue. One of the most fundamental commandments in Judaism is Torah Chat You will have one commandment, one Torah for us and the convert. When somebody is converted, they are 100% Jewish and their descendants are 100% Jewish. The meaning of using uh, mitochondrial DNA to prove Judaism means that in a thousand years' time, the convert's descendants will never have Jewish DNA. They won't be considered to be, if we, we're taking the biological terms of Judaism, they'll never be 100% equal. And I'm worried about a future where within some Jewish circles, people are doing DNA testing to see who they want to go on a date uh, with, and they're finding that somebody's ancestors may have converted and they're only 50% Jewish DNA. So I think we can never fully observe the Jewish commandment of, have the same um, Judaism Torah chatu mishpat echad if we uh, use DNA to prove Judaism. I think that's uh, fundamental to Jewish law, even before we start doing the other social implications and uh, which we have to make a test to all the Haredi, but they need to appear that they also are half. Right. <laughs> <laughs> there was a there was an article on television that Bishai Ben Chaim did where he um, did DNA tests for a few. Um, and so when the people was the Rav Yisrael Lau, the father, the mm -hmm. previous chief rabbi, and I think he came out. I think it was ninety four percent Jew Judaism. He was shocked that he had six percent non Jewish uh, DNA. Actually, it's good to have the uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe I, I, also have, I also have a question mm -hmm. uh, point on that. So we're just going to collect questions quickly and, yeah. and finish because some, we're running out of time. So what is your question? Then me, uh, Moshe had a question and then we, we close. So, so my question is, how do you put the whole campaign of Dior Barasaga in the political context? I mean, seeing that this campaign came, it's about approximately one year after the campaign of Kuchovit Yul which was the Shas political campaign, which um, was taken offline. I was uh, pulling it off the, uh, off, the, off the television, but that had quite a, a large impact. And I think that the people within the conversion courts uh, who are not, they don't have to do what the Ministry of Religious Services says. So they don't have to listen to people doing that campaign. They're affected by both campaigns. Kuchovit Yur and Yur Barasaga. So I mean, how do you think they, I, like, I, there's some connection between them. And what is, Moshe, what is your question? So it's not, it's not a question, it's just a, um, you said about the visibility, right? One, one of the points, the visibility and, and the point where they took uh, the um, Jewish or not Jewish out of the um, uh, ID cards. So as in my other hat, I'm a tour guide. And one of the groups I guided a few years ago was a policeman. I guided a few groups of policemen. I, we talked about Jewish uh, Israeli identity, and then, and then we talked about this this uh, change. And I said, yes, but you know, you can we can still as policemen 
we, we can uh, we can know if they're Jewish or not. And they said, no, how can you? And they say, because they don't have a Hebrew birth date right. on their IDs. So this means that wow. they are not Jewish. Right. They can be Arabs or others, but they are not Jewish. Right. Right. So for your use every day. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to expose someone, you can use. Right. Ask for his idea. <laughs> um, so first I will just respond to, it's, it was not a question to me, but something that you said in response. Um, I don't think that we should think about Jewish identity as either biologically grounded or it has like a biological essence or a cultural one. I think that's like, you know, as a geographer, I see how we culturally rework what we think is biology and use it for our causes. So different people, like even Matan was saying that the Jewish gene, there is no Jewish gene, like there isn't such a thing, right? Like there is like, like this broad correlation, statistical correlation that if it comes in us, right? So you yeah. have something about this mountain, with this uh, profile. I'm not aware of any direct link between the 2013 Shas content of Yur and the 2014 Yur Bar Saga. It is based on this, like it is part of an ongoing political drama. I think it, it was a kind of backlash, not only to this campaign, but in general backlash to people, politicians and others who try to distance, to sort of close down the national mission and take it out of the Zionist frame and not like not actualize what the national mission has to do. But you know, the, the COVID campaign aroused so many critics in different kinds of publics. There are all these, these kind of memes, right? Like yeah. jokes about endless memes about you know what it means to to not be uh, so but, but it resurfaced um, just a few months ago in uh, there's a campaign of Irgun Liba, which is based on COVID Gio. It's the same I'm not sure. I'll, I'll so tell you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, and yes. You could always, like, you know, expose someone, and but it's much less like for the convert that I met. The fact that they received a new ID, and of course, they knew that someone can catch them, or there is like this, like, invisible, like, you know, invisible line there, they knew it. But for them, getting a new ID was a kind of rite of passage, as if like the state recognized them in alliance with how they see themselves. So, like some of them even actually made a ritual, a bureaucratic ritual, out of getting a new ID card. Um, okay, thank you very much. This was such a